Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. Little backstory. My aunt has always had a greedy streak ever since I was a kid. She is the type of person that will yell at a store employee because something that was advertised isn't in stock or not at that particular store or not on sale and has been banned from entering multiple stores. When my grandmother was on her deathbed, my aunt had talked her way into getting my grandmother to sign her on as an executor of the will and ended up taking everything and anything that had the most value. Fast forward. My uncle was my best friend. I always looked up to him as a kid. He was a truck driver, so he would be gone for a long time, and I remember one summer he even took me with him on the road. But sadly, my uncle had cancer, and while he was in the hospital, my aunt had tried to get him to assign her as an executor of his will. But since he was quick to pick up on what happened when my grandmother passed away, he hired a professional estate lawyer that would take care of everything. If you can imagine, my aunt was not very happy and was quick to throw out a sob story of how offended she was that her brother couldn't trust her with an important task. This went on for two weeks. Even on his last day in hospice, she still brought it up and was asked to leave by nurses. He passed away peacefully in 2011. Now I didn't know it at the time but I quickly found out why my aunt was so we were all asked to gather at my mom's home, where the estate lawyer came to tell us who was getting what. So finally my time came on the list and I was surprised to have anything willed to me. What did my uncle will to me? Why his rig and car, of course. My uncle's rig is a 2008 Lone Star International, which was fully loaded. My uncle's car is a 1966 Chevelle AS. My first thought was, what in the hell am I going to do with a big rig? My aunt's first thought. Well, she didn't have a first thought. She just screamed and cussed at the lawyer, saying that I was too sick to have those things and didn't deserve them. Because I was his nephew and not his sister, the lawyer asked her to sit down and he would get to her. When my aunt sat down, she looked at me and said, you're giving me the title to both of those to which I laughed and said in your dreams, maybe... The lawyer kept going down the list, and because my uncle was a legend, he put my aunt at the bottom of the list and said to quote to my sister, I am leaving her my luckiest, most important dollar, because all present at this meeting will know she needs it most, and then was handed the dirtiest-looking Canadian one-dollar coin, which was sealed in a block of acrylic. Myself, my dad, and my other uncles nearly wet ourselves laughing. My aunt, however, didn't find it that funny and instead went into another tirade on how this was unfair and saying she didn't have anything to hold on that was his. The day passed and then the nightmare began. My aunt would call over and over and over asking about the truck, wanting to buy the car, if I was going to sell the truck, if I was going to sell the truck, if I was going to sell the car, all to which I said no. Things got worse when my aunt started saying that she wanted her car and she had someone that wanted to buy her truck. At this point, I got extremely irritated and said, it's not your car, it's my car and my car staying with me. And it's not our truck, it's my truck and no one is buying it. A week later, I woke up and heard something. So I went to investigate and there was a tow truck in the driveway. I quickly told the tow truck driver, who was a friend of my aunt, that if he so much as put a hand on that Chevelle, I would have him arrested for trespassing and grand theft and then proceeded to call the police. Cops showed up and I told the police officer my side of the story. Then he went to my aunt, and the conversation went like this. Cop, ma'am, can you tell me, is this your car? Uh, yes, it is. He just won't give it to me. Cop, ma'am, do you have the title of the vehicle? Aunt, no, I do not. He won't give that to me. Cop, well, ma'am, I looked at the registration and title of the vehicle, and he is listed as the owner of the vehicle. That vehicle is legally not yours and having it towed could land you and your friend prison time for auto theft. Yeah. Well, I think I am the one who should get the car because he can't even take care of himself. Cop, ma'am, it doesn't matter what you think. What matters is legal ownership, which you do not have. A week later, my aunt had attempted to take me to court for the car, which the case wasn't even put before a judge. My aunt refiled the claim again. It went to court and once I provided a copy of the will. Title and registration, the judgment went in my favor and my aunt was forced to pay my court costs after dismissing my aunt's claims with prejudice, meaning she can never file that lawsuit again. Then tragedy struck again. This time a great uncle passed away. I was on the will, again. 
Can you guess what was left to me? A new car. My great uncle's 1967 Chevrolet Impala SS, which he restored himself. My great aunt, his widow, was thrilled that I got it, but the mood was quickly soured when she realized that my entitled aunt, her niece, really was not thrilled that I got it. This time she stepped it up a notch and skipped the screaming and complaining and instead went scheming. Three days after I took possession of the Impala, she rented not just one flatbed, but two flatbeds. She managed to get the Impala onto the flatbed and sped off, leaving her boyfriend behind attempting to get the Chevelle on his flatbed as quickly as he could while I stood by on the phone with police. Police quickly caught up with my aunt and arrested, her boyfriend in my driveway, and soiled himself in the process. Hearn and her boyfriend both were hit for two counts of motor vehicle theft. Both were charged and found guilty and sentenced to two years and two days in jail. End points. Hmm. I haven't spoken to or heard from my aunt since she got out of prison, and I have no desire to. Before she was released from jail, I filed a restraining order against her, and it has stood since then. But the last I heard, she is still screaming at store employees, complaining about money and asking about me and the vehicles. Hmm. I still am the owner of all three vehicles, the Chevelle, the Impala, and the Lone Star International, and don't plan on selling any of them. I repair and build computers for a living, but more and more I've been getting into auto repair as a hobby. Hmm. As I do live in Canada, I do not drive the Impala or Chevelle during winter months, but every year I always take my great aunt, who is now 96 years old, to, a, to get a burger, onion rings, and an ice-cold root beer in the Impala, which is something my great uncle did for her since he got the Impala in 1970. Hmm. A very good friend of my uncle's, who now owns a business, actually rents the Lone Star International from me. He promised me that he would not get a single scratch or spot rust on any single part of it, and to this day that Lone Star looks factory new and has been all over the world. The guy that rents the truck even continued doing a little tradition my uncle did, which was to get a decal on the truck of the state province territory flag of the places the truck has visited. It currently has 31 state decals and three province decals on it. Hmm. My great aunt isn't in great health, and she has told me that she put me in her will so that I will get her cars, which were two of my great uncle's first cars, originally left to her in the will which are a 1950 H. Chevrolet Impala and 1957 Plymouth Belvedere Fury, which is my favorite car. I saw that movie Christine when I was six years old in 1996 ever since I loved the car because she knows that I will take care of it and park it right beside the 67 Impala Cess. I can already imagine the fallout that I'm going to get for that, so there may even be another post, though I really do hope there is not. Update 1. E.A. Entitled Ant. G-A-E Great Aunt. So I'm not really sure how this is actually done or if I'm doing this right. I looked everywhere and information is kind of limited, so it'll just jump to it. Quite a few things have changed. So to start, G-A is doing much better medically and she's looking forward to her 97th birthday. I was actually inspired to make this update because I just recently took her for our usual Anna trip, which she loved. Her mind was also blown that now is also blown that now a sells frozen root beer which had me laughing for about 15 minutes straight because she couldn't understand why someone would want a block of root beer. I had to order one and show her that it's like an icy or a Slurpee from 7-Eleven. Turns out before he passed away, my great uncle was working on restoring his 1958 Nash Metro, which I think is moderately terrifying because if you crash that steering column, it's going to go right through you and you're going to go through whatever car you crash into since that thing is a little tank. G.A. really doesn't want to hear about the Fury or the Nash anymore, so she gave me the title to the Fury. My cousin really wanted the Nash, which my aunt obliged him, and I'm not even disappointed because I think that thing is ugly as sin. He uh, found out about it and threw a fit, was on her way to my house, but without me even knowing this took place, I was surprised to find out that my mom had actually called police. And police had called her E. E. A to tell her that if she set foot on my property, then that would violate the protection order and she would be charged and so she had best stop the car, turn around, and head home. Well, she couldn't get the Plymouth Fury, but by golly, she was going to try to get that Nat Metro. My cousin had called me and told me that she actually went to his house under the pretense of a pleasant visit and said that the visit went nicely for maybe an hour and then suddenly the golem switch was flipped and she started listing off reasons as to why he needs to give her the Nash, such as, when she was little, she would ride in the Nash. She deserved it, low LL. 
He wouldn't take care of it also, lol, because he has a 66 Pontiac GTO that I've been trying to buy off of him for seven years. It would be much safer at her place, despite the fact that he lives about 20 miles from where I live in the middle of nowhere. All of these did not phase my cousin, and instead he told her to get out of his house after citing the reason of how it was kind of. His dad's car? He had to deal with her pestering him for around seven months, and then he finally just blocked any form of contact with her. She hasn't tried anything since. G.A. then went on to sell the farm, which upset it even more because that's one more thing she can't have, and it is even in the will that my cousin and I retain the vehicles at all times, and now my cousin gets the house in town, which was changed from Ia to my cousin. And so the dust has settled now and things are all good. Now some pretty good things have come out of this. So number one is when I found out that my mom was the one that called the police on my aunt, that led me to talk to my mom for the first time in five or six years, and now we are on speaking terms. I also have a much better relationship with my cousin since we were never really that close to each other to begin with, and he was blown away at the fact that I have a full-on machine shop on my property, so on. Weekends we will be in the shop talking, and he has been helping me with my project. My project is, I found a Lincoln Continental MK. I, I, and ever since I was a kid, it's been a dream to have the cars from the movie. Well, the car. So we have started chopping the crap out of it and making everything by hand to get it looking perfect. The Impala, Chevelle, and Lone Star are all doing great. The Lone Star had a bit of a hiccup and the entire transmission and engine needed to be replaced, but Lone Star actually said that the engine should have been replaced long ago so that all got done and signed off on, along with a new hitch plate being installed on it. My uncle's friend still rents the Lone Star from me for his business, and he even got a custom decal put on the trailer for it of a chicken hawk. My uncle's nickname was Chicken Hawk, and now has 42 state decals on it, up from 31, and 6 provincial decals, up from 3. Me and my cousin both got invited to a car club because we were at a recent car show. A friend of ours had recent dealings with this car club. They gave him some of the money needed to restore a 1951 Studebaker Woody and once the car was complete, they actually had taken him to court to get the car which now sits in their showroom. So me and my cousin asked them when our friend is going to get his Studebaker back, and then I said that I don't associate with people that have zero moral fiber. We are now working towards getting him his car back, since legally the people in the car club can't so much as sit in the car without our friend's permission. Since nothing was in writing, he has to pay the car club back, but won't get the car back, until he has paid the car club because his lawyer was an idiot. Before I forget, EA has actually had to come out of retirement, and now both her and her boyfriend are forced to go back to work since they ran out of money pretty quick. As it turns out, having multiple homes and going on vacation two and three times per year drains your bank account pretty darn quick. So, yeah, that's about it. 5 a.m., so it's time to get to work. Hope everyone out there has a good day evening and thank you for your time. Update 2. So I really never thought I would be touching this topic again, but Surprise! I'm back. Screw my life. So let's just jump right into it. This time we only have two characters which will be entitled Aunt, AA, and Uncle. Uncle. Here we go. So for those who have seen the last post, I have recently gotten onto speaking terms with some more members of my mother's side of the family, one of which being my uncle. I do need to put a little backstory in here on my uncle before we begin. So my uncle was paying it for a house she owned. They have a written agreement, which is almost like a rent-to-own agreement. So my uncle has been paying EA an inflated sum of money for three years, in total of which, when that sum hit 64000 that was it. The house was then given to my uncle. I will say it again. This is in writing. Now, a few years ago, my uncle got into a car accident, which was by no means his fault. He was actually hit by a bus driver who was intoxicated at the time, and because of that, he got a very large settlement. Because of that accident, my uncle broke both of his legs, so he gave her his bank card, and she was using that to do things such as pay his bills and get groceries for him. Now, here is where the problems begin. AA and my uncle got into an argument. She kicked him out of the house and refused to refund him the money he gave her. I also looked at the numbers for the settlement my uncle got. Out of 977000 by my count, only 125000 was actually spent on him. So by my account, my aunt has stolen a little over $1 million from my uncle, adding on the money given for the house which was never returned. 
I expected this, but I never in one million effing lifetimes expected this amount. Like, this isn't slap on the wrist kind of money. This is big trouble, big bad kind of money. I am effing livid. I haven't told my uncle yet, because to be honest, I don't know how the F to tell him. How the F do you tell your uncle? Yeah, your sister stole one million dollars from you. Also factor onto that my uncle is a recovering alcoholic. He still drinks here and there, but he doesn't get blackout drunk like he used to. But he's working for a friend of mine, who I told very directly, if you smell alcohol on him. Send him home without pay so I really don't want to tell him and have him go on a downward spiral. I honestly have no idea what to do. I know that I have to tell my uncle this, whether or not he chooses to pursue it. He won't have a choice because this isn't right. I will make him pursue it and I will give him my lawyer and pay for it. Do I even go to a lawyer for this? So anyways, anyways, I just had to put this out there. It is kind of vague for that I apologize, but for the time being, this is all the information I have. Some things are just hard to fathom. Our house is on a downslope and the front patio sits below the street. Even though we live in a metro area, our streets do not have sidewalks just the street and a dirt area between the road and our fence. This area between actually belongs to the city, but as is usual, the property owners are required to maintain it. Last summer, I had just decided to give it a small makeover and had pulled up the bricks that had been framing the plant area and stacked them against the fence, while I decided what exactly what I was going to do. One evening during this time, my family and I were sitting around our fire table out on the front patio enjoying a nice evening. My sons and their sows had driven over to visit us and wanted to park on the side of the road in front of our fence. We were all sitting around chatting and having a nice time. I was sitting facing the upslope and happened to notice the shape of someone walking by, but between the car and our fence. Now that's not a big deal. I had just dug up the plants that had been there, but it was a little weird because this is a little tight and there was more room on the street side. I didn't think too much about it until I saw someone do it again. It's not a busy street so there really was no need to go that way. I thought something was off because they had to deliberately make the choice to take a narrow path instead of the easier path. So I decided to see what was going on. I walked up the stairs and looked at the area between car and fence. I was stunned to see that almost all of the bricks were gone. I looked down the street, and there was the young 20-something boy riding away on a bicycle with some of my bricks in his basket. What the hell? I yelled at him, and he stopped and looked back. I walked over to him to ask him what was going on. Biker. E.M. Me. 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 What are you doing with my bricks? E.M. They were just sitting there, so I thought I would take them. Keep in mind he had to park his bike and walk between the car and the fence to reach them, and six people were sitting twenty feet away, three facing his way. Me. Those bricks belong to me. Why would you think you could just take them? That's stealing. E.M., I'm not stealing. They were on land owned by the city, technically true, and so they must be free to anyone. Me, no, that's not how it works. It may be city land, but I'm required to maintain it. And even if they were the cities, you would still be stealing the bricks from them. E.M., well, I was told differently, so I just decided I could have them. Me, stop trying to justify stealing. I need you to take these bricks on the bike back to where you got them, and then go and get all the others you stole, right now. This conservation was repeated many times as he kept defending his actions, and it took over ten minutes to convince him he had to return the bricks. He seemed so confused, looking at me with big, sad eyes, like they were just sitting there in front of your house, so of course they're not yours, so of course they're not yours, so I can just take them. Why are you accusing me of stealing? For a minute, I felt like I kicked a puppy. Then I snapped out at it and explained, again, to him exactly how the land use works, how it's wrong to take anything that doesn't belong to him, and once again demanded he return all of my bricks. I watched him take them off his bike, then ride down the block and gather the rest, one load at a time, and restack them in front of the fence. I was steaming. I've never in all my life, 60, come across a person so ignorant in how the world works. And I gather from what his roommates told him, there are more of them out there that think this way. By the way, it turns out they are college students renting a house. I feel very sorry for their landlord and teachers. My name's Alex, not my real name, but I'm a tech-savvy guy in my mid-30s living in a cozy suburban neighborhood. Now, 
Let me tell you about the saga of Karen, the most entitled and aggressive woman you'll ever meet, and her pack of unruly dogs. Karen, probably in her late 40s, had a habit of letting her five or six dogs roam freely in our neighborhood. She never bothered to clean up after them, much to the chagrin of our neighbor, Mr. Churchill. Mr. Churchill, a sweet old man who bore a striking resemblance to Winston Churchill, was a retired veteran living alone. His yard was like a minefield of dog poop thanks to Karen's negligence. I remember one incident vividly. It was a sunny Saturday morning and I was tinkering with some gadgets in my garage when I heard Mr. Churchill's booming voice. Karen, for the love of sanity, keep your mutts off my lawn, he yelled across the fence. Karen, true to her entitled nature, just waved him off and continued chatting on her phone. Another time, I saw Mr. Churchill struggling to clean up his yard yet again. I couldn't help but feel sorry for him. Hey, Mr. Churchill, need a hand? I offered. He sighed heavily. Thanks, Alex, but it's not your mess to clean up. That Karen needs a lesson in responsibility. Fast forward to the breaking point. It was a quiet night, around 2.00 a.m., and I was engrossed in some late-night coding when I heard a loud crash followed by the sound of crackling flames. I rushed to the window and saw Mr. Churchill's house engulfed in fire. Without wasting a second, I dialed 911 and then rushed outside to check on Mr. Churchill. Thankfully, he was already out, coughing from the smoke but otherwise okay. The fire department arrived promptly and soon the blaze was under control. As we stood there watching the firefighters do their job, Mr. Churchill turned to me with a grim expression. I bet it was Karen. She's been seething ever since I told her off about her dogs. I nodded, anger bubbling inside me. I wouldn't put it past her. Let me check my security camera footage. Sure enough, the footage revealed Karen sneaking into Mr. Churchill's yard in the dead of night, carrying a bottle with a cloth sticking out of it, a Molotov cocktail, a homemade incendiary device. I showed the footage to the police when they arrived, and Mr. Churchill wasted no time in pressing charges against her for arson and endangering lives. When the cops confronted Karen, she put on her best innocent act. I didn't do anything. It's all a misunderstanding. The officer raised an eyebrow, showing her the damning footage. Care to explain this, Karen? She faltered, her entitled facade crumbling. Well, he deserved it. Always complaining about my dogs and messing with my peace. Mr. Churchill's eyes blazed with fury. You could have killed me, you crazy woman! Karen was promptly arrested and charged with arson, endangerment, and trespassing. As she was led away in handcuffs, she shot me a venomous glare. This is all your fault, you nosy neighbor? I just shook my head, feeling a mix of relief and anger. No, Karen, this is all on you and your entitled attitude. In the end, justice was served, and Mr. Churchill's home was repaired. Karen, on the other hand, faced the consequences of her actions, learning the hard way that entitlement and aggression never lead to anything good. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. Been a lurker for a while and finally created an account. So, this might not be the most entertaining I don't work here lady story, but it's bizarre in that I very obviously didn't do what the lady thought I did. So for context... This is at the second largest airport in the UK. It's the biggest base for my airline, which every European knows is the big orange one. My airline is the most popular in the country and very well known. We're the only orange one, so we're very obviously who we are. So I've 27 female, just arrived at work, and I'm walking through the terminal to my gate to board my aircraft, meet the crew, and do security checks, etc., and prepare for my flight. I have my suitcase and handbag with me, both company issue and my uniform, which is a black dress, orange neck scarf, black heels, and matching orange-black suit jacket. My hair is in the stereotypical flight attendant bun, and I'm probably wearing lipstick, but I don't remember. I don't in any way look like I'm anything other than a stewardess. The airport worker's uniform is a teal polo with black suit trousers. The opposite to mine. I can understand if I'm ever mistaken for a gate agent as they wear similar clothes, but the airport employees don't, so on to the story. I was still new at the time, so I'm confused about where my gate is, and I'm standing around checking my phone and the screens, out of the way of passengers passing by. An old lady walks up to me, and I think to myself that she's wondering where her gate is. I could try to help with that, but I can't even find my own. If she wants to know in advance what her gate will be before it's called, I could probably help with that, though. 
No, she doesn't ask me to help. She hands me a strange rectangular black object resembling a TV remote which I've never seen before in my life. I'm just going to give you this, she says, thrusting it at me. What is it? I ask, trying to make it clear that I can't put it away anywhere and that I have nothing to do with whatever it was. It's the device to call the buggy, she explained. Uh... She thinks that because I work at the airport, I also work with the special assistance buggy drivers. While I technically work at the airport, I only work from the airport. On the planet. I have no idea where the buggy drivers are based or have any clue about their operations. I explain this to her. I'm afraid I'm cabin crew. I don't have anything to do with this. I can't take it from you. Sorry. I definitely wouldn't be able to take it on my flights with me. It needed to go back where it belonged. As crew, the idea unattended, unidentified electronic items gives me the heebie. Jeebies. She keeps her entitled, I'm an old lady, you have to help me smile on, and says again, I'm just going to give it to you, very insistently. Realizing I'm not going to win and I'll be late to my flight if I don't end this interaction and find my gate, I take it reluctantly and say something she probably wants to hear. Okay, I'll give it to my manager. And she walks off. I don't even have a manager. They change every flight depending on the crew. So great. I'm stood there with this strange remote control looking thing. I can't just set it down anywhere. So I have to look for a buggy driver to give it to. As luck would have it, one rolled up and stopped next to me a couple minutes later taking passengers to the nearby gate, and I hand the driver the remote. Surely the lady would have seen that I wasn't dressed at all like the driver of her buggy. Surely she'd know what they look like if she'd taken one, as she must have if she had the remote thing. And how did she have the remote if she hadn't got out of a buggy? As far as I knew, she was just walking around with it. I didn't see her get out of one, and if she's been one, why not leave it there? The more I think about it, the more questions arise. Also, I asked the driver where my gate was, and they told me the wrong one. Seems like everyone's lost in this airport. I fortunately wasn't late, but I was a bit bewildered. So yeah, a bit of a boring story, but was mildly entertaining when I was telling my colleague and I wanted to contribute to this great sub. Have a great day, guys. Years ago, shortly after I had left the service, my girlfriend, now wife, and I moved in together halfway across the U.S. from both of our respective families. Long stories for another time, and to a place where we both had friends as a result of our military travels. One of my wife's friends, we'll call her Anna, had gotten married in the intervening years since they had last been together, and was in the process of a divorce since her husband had knocked up the checkout girl at the local orchard. She had left the home, a single, wide trailer, important later, they owned, left the car they owned, which she had solely paid for, and was still in her name, moved back in with her parents and got a second job. She already worked at a large, big-box retail establishment. Of course, my wife and I commiserate with her on multiple occasions about how poorly she had been treated. Anna made a remark at one point about missing her bills that month. My wife asked what bills. You live with your parents, you have two jobs, no credit cards, and you never do anything expensive. What could you possibly owe anyone money for? It turns out that she still had a checking account linked to her ex-husband's account, and when he decided not to pay the mortgage or the car payment, they simply took it out of her account marked the loan current, and went on with their lives. Shortly after the divorce, he would make most payments, but for the last year or so, he hasn't made a single one. So ex-hubby has perfect credit because he never misses a payment, and Anna's credit is in toilet because she is constantly late on her own bills. Anna may have two jobs and not a lot of bills, cell phone, car payment, insurance. When she's making someone else's mortgage and car payments as well, she's pretty much broke, and that why she never does anything expensive and has to have me change her oil in my gravel driveway because she can't afford $20 for Jiffalu. I asked her why she didn't close the accounts and go somewhere else. Anna's answer, but if they miss their payments, the bank will take their house and their car, and they have a baby. I can't do that to them. I did the Forrest Whitaker eye. Then I said they're taking advantage of you pretty badly. They've established that you'll pay all their bills for them, and they can do whatever the hell they want, because you'll never force the sale of the house or the car. If I had an option to pay my bills or pass it off to someone I don't like, I'd let them do it every time. He's paying an electric bill and getting a free house, car, and everything else. 
And I guarantee you that he's handing these bills to the social worker and claiming he can't afford to live so they'll give him with food stamps and everything else. You're funding the lifestyle of a jerk who cheated on you and a woman who knew he was married because every time she came over, she made him take your wedding pictures down so she didn't have to look at you while she got intimate with your husband. You're paying bills for a guy who is so dumb that he thought he couldn't get a woman pregnant he wasn't married to, and a woman who thought that because she was cheating, she wouldn't get pregnant. Those witches. You see, I may not give a rip about most of my family, but you do not mess with my friends. She gives it some thought and a couple of days later asks for some help out of this. I took her to my bank to get an account the next day. She moves her direct deposit, withdraws her money, and closes her old account. Next month, ex-hubby's bills don't get paid. We're watching a movie when he calls. She spends an hour in a screaming match with him telling him to pay his own bills. She has been charitable enough, and he and his new wife can pay for their own stuff. Then, the penny dropped. Remember earlier when I said the house with a trailer? Anna has been paying the mortgage on the trailer, but not the rent for the lot it's on. They never had her checking account. This entitled prick has been assuming she's been paying that too. She assumed he had... He hasn't even figured out what's coming yet. He's calling because he's pissed off she hasn't paid the lot rent in forever, and he's being told to pay up, move his trailer, or they'll do it and hold the trailer in arrears until the bill for moving it is paid. He's calling to ask her for another $6,000, or they'll lose the home they both love so much. Now, up until this moment, Anna had been the sweet, wonderful gumdrop of a person. The type of person that it should be legal to slap if they're encountered before 9 a.m. The relentlessly sunny person that you send into the room to cheer up Tinkerbell. For the better part of a year, I haven't heard this woman say a bad thing about anybody. Until tonight. Until this guy called to complain that she hadn't been paying enough of his bills. And she loses her mind. She lights into this guy that he'd better figure it out because he's not getting another penny from her ever again. And while he's figuring out who to beg, borrow, or steal that money from, he may want to get a little extra since he's about to get the overdue notices for the house and the car, too. He starts screaming so loud I can clearly hear what he's calling her from across the room before she calmly hits the end button, flips the phone over, pops the battery out, sets them both down on my table, his play on the VCR, morphs back into her normally sunny self, and offers to make popcorn. Monday morning, she went to the lawyer, filed a no-contact order, filed for bankruptcy. Her credit was already a mess. There were bills her name was on and she didn't want that splatter all over her. And called the dealer that owned her car note, told her she couldn't make the payments anymore, and offers in a voluntary repossession has them bring out their tow truck and meets the driver with the key and the paperwork. Signs them forms, asks the driver, oh so sweetly to drop her off at her parents' house on the way back to the dealer, and waves at her ex from the passenger seat of the tow truck as he comes running out of the trailer wearing only a towel. Over the course of the next month or two, he lost his job because he couldn't get to work anymore. His wife had to go back to weighing pears at the orchard. Turns out she'd left her job when Anna was paying for everything and sell his record collection, which was what he'd been spending his money on while someone else was paying for everything. On the bright side, I picked up original vinyl copies of Abbey Road and Yellow Submarine for a total of $5 because his idiot wife running their yard sale didn't understand why the old, crappy records were worth anything anyway. And that's how Tinkerbell burned some entitled jerk's life to the ground. So this happened a few hours ago, and I will give the base of context. Cast. Op me, of course. EM, my lovely former foster mother who cannot be wrong about anything. So today I had an orthodontist appointment to get released from my retainers. My goodness, those things were a pain if you fidget with your tongue. And my lovely former foster mother wanted me to come over, she offered to pay me, to help clean out the trailer behind her house because her renters just up and left pretty much everything they own behind. So we had to find anything of value and set it aside. I found all kinds of stuff like a webcam and box knife hunting knife and a knife sharpening brick. Well, it gets to about lunchtime, and once I eat lunch, I go back towards the trailer, and as I'm about to start working... I wanted to listen to some music on Spotify since I had three months of premium for free thanks Microsoft rewards. 
My lovely EM gets angry and demands I turn my music off. Meanwhile, there's other music blasting in different directions because it's more than just me cleaning out that trailer. And I point that out, and she starts getting more belligerent and adamant that I turn my music off because she can't stand. The music I like. Well, then she slaps the ultimatum down that either I turn up my music or I go home, which I decided to go home since there's no arguing with a person who believes they're the only ones allowed to be right. I go to get in her car, and then she slaps me with this EM turn that damn curse music off or walk home. OP fine, I'll walk, but at least let me unlock the bike that I own. EM know you disrespected me and for that you walk home. She obviously didn't think I would. So that's when I take off walking towards where I live, which noted is about five miles from where she lives. So I get one four of the way there and she calls me at first. I didn't want to answer, but some guy feeling told me to. Well, I answered and put it on speaker to let her hear the road noise, to let her know I wasn't bluffing, and I get screamed at for making her look bad, and blah blah blah. Honestly, I was too angry and anxious to remember what happened afterwards, but she did mention that she expects payback for all of my braces and retainer appointments because she apparently wasted her gas and all that lovely garbage of a narcissistic parent. Oh, and also she's trying to force me to move out into her middle of nowhere because then I can't walk to the store, I'll have to keep contact if I want to eat. Anyways, thanks for listening and reading. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences, opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.